Hello everyone, welcome to the next lecture in the topic of LiDAR remote sensing. In the last lecture, we got introduced to what LiDAR remote sensing is and its basic working principle. This week we will, uh, sorry this lecture we will continue with that particular topic further. So in the last lecture, I basically told you uh, LiDAR is like a ranging tool which measures the distance between the transmitter and the uh, target of interest. So essentially the heart of LiDAR remote sensing is ranging, how precisely or how accurately we range uh, the distance between the transmitter and the receiver. This ranging can happen in two ways, one is the time of flight method and the other one is like the phase difference method. So time of flight method which is often used in remote sensing is like the simple way with that we know light is a laser beam will be transmitted towards the target, it will be reflected off the target and it will come back. So this particular transmitter will measure the time taken for the beam to go and come back and using like simple principle of like uh, d is equal to ct by 2 where c is like the velocity of light or electromagnetic radiation, t is the time taken for this entire two way flight and divided by 2 we do it because the beam has to go in the forward direction and again come back towards the receiver. So using the simple formula we can calculate it. This is the time of flight method and most often used in remote sensing. In some survey instruments we also use a phase difference method. Phase difference method means we send in continuous uh, beam of laser. So here if we send a pulse like one pulse will be transmitted uh, like for certain duration say 1 nanosecond, 5 nanoseconds like that for like a very short time period a pulse will be transmitted towards the target which will go reflect and come back. After that we will send in another pulse like that. But in case of like continuous beam we will be continuously transmitting laser. We will uh, combine the laser wavelength with a carrier wave, we will transmit it, it will go and come back. So uh, based on the distance between the transmitter and receiver, we will uh, the phase of the wave will vary like let us say at this point we are transmitting a wave, we know the phase at which it is transmitted and based on the distance the phase will change. Say if the distance is uh, integral multiple of wavelength, uh, the phase may not change. Let us say uh, wavelength is for like simple example I am telling, let us say the wavelength is uh, 1 centimeter. Say the distance between the transmitter and receiver is 30 meters. So 30 meter is kind of like an integral multiple of this, right? Uh, say every meter has 100 centimeters. So this is like 3000 centimeters which is an integral multiple. If the distance is exactly like this, the phase will not change because whenever it travels a distance of one wavelength, it will uh, complete like one full cycle of phase 0 to uh, 2 pi, 0 pi by 2 pi, 3 pi by 2 and 2 pi. So one full phase cycle is completed. So if the distance is integral mul number of like uh, wavelength, the phase will not vary. But if the distance is even slightly uh, different than this integral multiple of this particular wavelength, then the phase of the received signal and transmitted signal will vary and by come applying this phase relationship or by observing this phase relationship, this is transmitted, this is received, what is the phase difference between them? By knowing this, we can calculate the delta lambda or like the small difference in distance between them and by independent methods it is there to measure this n lambda. So the total distance is equal to n lambda plus delta lambda where n lambda is measured separately like that is like the integral multiple of wavelength uh, plus the delta lambda. Let us say the distance is 30.2 meters. Okay, If the distance was 30 meters in our example of 1 centimeter, it will be like n lambda only will be there, this delta lambda will not be there. If the distance is 30 point, uh, let us say 30.22 meters or 2 to 5 meters which is not integral multiple of 1 centimeter, this delta lambda has to be measured separately. Okay, So that separation will occur, that measurement will occur separately and they will be added together. This is using like phase difference. But this is normally not being done for like a 
air one or space one radar, radar systems where we use the time of flight method. We observe the time taken for the laser pulse to go and come back and use that. So essentially in the time of flight method, the entire accuracy of the ranging system uh, depends on the accuracy with which we measure like the time taken, that is one thing. We have to precisely measure the time, like some of the space one systems has like a precision of in the order of like picoseconds, okay. So we can measure like even like very tiny fraction of time, that is possible. Because light travels with like very huge velocity like 3 into 10 power 8 meter per second. So even like in 1 nanosecond difference means we will be like uh, making errors in the distance measured. So the uh, time should be measured very precisely and accurately. And also we need to know have like a clear knowledge about like the velocity of the laser beam. Like if it is like a short terrestrial application it is okay. I am here, the target is in front of me. Uh, the distance can be, uh, the distance is short, so not much of atmospheric change will happen, velocity I can consider it as constant. But let us say I am doing it from satellite, from space. So when the laser beam travels through space, uh, there can be different, different mediums. Like we know the atmosphere is kind of like stratified, it has different layers. So each layer has certain property. The velocity of light will change when it passes through different medium. It has to pass through ionosphere, troposphere, mesosphere, lot of different layers. The velocity may change. So we need to know accurately how the velocity change and people will measure them or model them in order to uh, get like an accurate distance measurement. So the major factors uh, we need to keep in mind in the time of light method is uh, the time, the measurement of time. Uh, we, it should be like precise and accurate and also the our knowledge about the velocity of light as it travels through different medium. So this slide contains some basic uh, formula for the time of light method. So pulsed lasers is what they use, they send in like laser pulses, it emits large number of pulses every second, maybe some ground based systems will be like 10,000, 40,000 pulses per second, some satellite based system will be in the order of say 10,000 pulses per second and so on. And then the time is measured very simply using like the range formula that we are like already seen. And also from an airborne platform point of view, I am I'm just discussing this. Let us say like we have like an airborne platform uh, with like a scanning mechanism attached to it. It can scan certain angle of like uh, theta. At that circumstances, the footprint size of the laser beam can be calculated by this formula h into uh, gamma divided by cos square theta instant. So footprint as I told uh, it is kind of like the projection of laser beam onto the ground. Say so whenever like a laser beam starts it will directly uh, come in like that then it will heat the surface. So it is kind of like projection of the beam that originated from the transmitter. It has small amount of divergence, so it won't be coming in perfectly parallel. Uh, it won't be coming in like this parallelly. There'll be some small divergence. So based on the divergence and the flying height, the footprint size will vary essentially. So the footprint is basically depends on the flying height and the divergence of the beam. This is applicable if the beam is transmitted towards nadir. But if the aircraft has a scanning mechanism attached to it, then as the scan as the scanning mechanism moves away from nadir, then the circular footprint, the footprint is more or less circular in nadir, like the beam will be coming in kind of like a cylinder which will project a small circular area of the ground. So that may become ellipse based on the angle. It may become slightly elliptical and the footprint size will increase. In order to account for that change, we are using this cos square theta instant, where theta instant is the instantaneous scan angle. Let us say this is like the position at which the measurement was made. So this instant, the scan angle at this particular instant at which this range R is measured, that is theta instant. So there can be many different theta instances like each of the location in the scan position, okay, we will have 1 1 theta instant. 
by accounting for this we can measure it. So, this is with respect to airborne platform. Normally, the space borne platforms that are currently in operation, uh, they do not do any kind of like scanning, they just send in pulses at nadir. So, this will not happen, the cos square theta instant we may not uh, take care of it. Uh, the laser pulse depends on the flying height and the divergence of the beam. Basically, it produces like a circular footprint on the ground. And similarly, like uh, the swath width, especially if your system is attached with like a scanning mechanism, you can define like a swath width. Again, it is very similar to what we have learnt already for our normal whisk broom scanners. The swath width is given by 2 h tan theta by 2, where here the theta is like the entire angle with which the uh, system can scan. Theta instantaneous is at that particular instant of range measurement that is theta instant. Whereas the entire theta is the total scan angle at which the systems can scan. The swath width can be defined like that. But normally again in satellite systems since uh, scanning is not happening like whatever is currently there in space uh, scanning may not happen. But they will send in like multiple beams uh, that are like uh, oriented in different different distances. It will measure the range of those footprints that are separated by certain distance and as the satellite moves in different different orbits it will cover like the entire ground like that it will measure. Then one more important thing we should see is the point spacing in both along track and across track direction. What is this point spacing? <coughs> uh, laser beam is like a ranging device we know. So for each point at which it uh, hits the ground the laser beam we will measure the range and effectively we can calculate the coordinate x, y, z of that particular point. So, if we want to measure the terrain in a very precise way, we need to have a large number of points, right. Uh, let us say we have like a small uh, hill like this, okay. So, this is, uh, let us say we the flight is coming in the plane uh, that is going into this boat, like the flight is flying. Uh, into the direction of the board okay, or your computer screen whatever. So, this is the across track direction. So, it is doing some sort of scanning. Let us say the point spacing happens once every uh, 300 meters, very coarse but just for explanation sake I am doing it. And let us say this hill has like a base distance of say 200 meters, it is like a very small mount not like a very tall mount okay. So, let us say the spacing is 300 meters. So, what will happen is. Uh, one point may be collected here, another point may be collected here or maybe somewhere at a distance or it can be like this, it can be here and here, okay. So, you will know the x, y, z of this particular point, you will know the x, y, z of this particular point, we are going to miss this small mound in between. So, when you have this x, y, z, normally what we will do when we process this points, we will normally get a points, x, y, z points. When we process that, we will join them using some sort of like interpolation mechanism. So, then our interpolation mechanism is not going to uh, reproduce the mound or the small hill in between, it is going to interpolate it like this point A, point B, the mound is missed. So, essentially for, in a, for us to get like a proper representation of the terrain, it is normally we will look for a high point density. Let us say the point density is pretty high, we are measuring like several points along the way or in the across track direction. Then if that is the case, then we will be able to measure all the points like x, y, z of all the points and our interpolation mechanism um, will properly uh, interpolate the surface like this. We will be getting like a uh, more accurate representation of the terrain. So, the point spacing basically defines uh, how dense uh, or how sparse we collect the ground based observations. So, this is also one of the important uh, parameter we should keep in mind when doing like LIDAR surveying. That is why like uh, terrestrial systems will have like a very high point density. It will try to cover like the uh, almost like with like um, uh, lakhs and lakhs of points of like uh, if you want to cover like a big building, it will send in like enormous amount of pulses to get the signals back. So, the point density will determine how precisely we are able to uh, track the surface and map the minor undulations present within it. So, this point spacing in the across track direction varies with pulse repetition frequency. Pulse repetition frequency is how frequently our system will transmit 
uh, LiDAR signal, maybe like as I told you 10,000 pulses per second and so on. And then altitude of the platform at which height the aircraft is flying that is going to have like a major say. Then the instantaneous angular scanning speed at which speed we are scanning more the scanning speed we are going to have like a lower point density. Then instantaneous scan angle forward speed of the platform all these things are going to affect our point density. So for like an airborne system the point spacing is given by the altitude of the platform cos square theta instant alpha instant alpha instant is the uh, angular scanning speed instantaneous angular scanning speed and PRF is like the uh, point repetition frequency or pulse repetition frequency. So this is one of like the important parameter like uh, where our points are spaced that is important to know. Till now we are discussing about the LiDAR transmission. How will LiDAR will receive the returns like I told you like laser beam will come in it will hit the target and it will go back. How the LiDAR beam will uh, will return and how the signals may be recorded that is what we are going to see. Within a footprint there need not be only one feature uh, with uniform elevation there can be several features let us say you have like a bare ground without any undulation then the single footprint of laser beam entire thing is going to hit this particular surface and it is going to go back. On the other hand let us say you are going to measure something over like a uh, land surface covered with trees or vegetation. Okay. So within a single beam of laser or like I just slightly exaggerated uh, for easy representation there can be like uh, small small leaves present within it like there can be like a tree standing next here and uh, these are like branches of the trees okay there can be like small plants standing on the ground and all these things. So what will happen this is like the beam of the laser this is the terrain okay so this is the terrain. So within this beam of laser the there will be like light photons everywhere present uh, continuously. So this uh, the photons are within the beam there are like many different scattering elements present say this leaf will reflect some portion back this leaf will reflect some portion back and uh, this plant may reflect something back there can be some reflection happening from the ground. So essentially the returns will be not a single return but it will be kind of like a continuous save like what is uh, represented here. Okay. So with respect to the time it will vary so this is maybe like the top single leaf it can be like a large canopy then these can be like small small leaves then again this is the ground. So there, it, there will be like multiple returns per pulse of laser light when there are like uh, more number of scattering elements present within the beam arranged at different different elevations. Okay. If that happens the laser return will be uh, you can imagine in terms of like a continuous uh, signal like there are like many different returns going back. Not all laser systems will be able to record all the returns that is coming back. This incoming returning signal can be recorded in two waves, two ways one is called a discrete return and another is called a full waveform return. So what exactly a discrete return is? A discrete return means the systems can store a certain number of return points per pulse say two returns per pulse, four returns per pulse and so on. Whereas some systems can store the entire signal that came back say if there are like uh, 50 or 60 reflections happened within that small laser beam all the 50 or 60 can be stored by some system. So the one with discrete thing will have or will store only like a selected portion of signal whereas like a full waveform LiDAR system can store like the uh, almost like the entire return that came back. So how the discrete system will work say let us say this is like the power 
of the signal that came back. So first thing is with respect to time we will be able to note what elevation it came in like this is like the top maybe like a small single leaf this is like a, a group of leaves that is like define the canopy this is like the ground and so on. Based on the uh, scattering happening there maybe there can be like a large cluster of leaves or the ground can be highly reflecting whatever. So based on the scattering happening each portion will return a small fraction of the incoming power like a single leaf may produce like a very weak return say within this beam here it is encountering only like one leaf whereas here it is encountering like a bunch of leaves. So naturally this bunch of leaves will produce like a higher return or the more power will be reflected back when you compare this with single leaf. So with time but with difference in arrangement of different scattering elements in the elevation in the z direction the power also will vary. So when there is like large, large number of like scattering elements with the high scattering capacity back scattering capacity uh, high power will be returned back but if there are like only one or two leaves it may return only like a very weak signal back. So based on it you the signals incoming signals will have variation in the power of the returned wave also ok. So the discrete uh, systems will look at like certain high power returns and may store it. Let us say our system is capable of storing 3 returns. So it will say okay this is one instant where there was like high power return. So uh, store the power and the time there. So this range will be measured, this power will be measured. Then the next power came in here somewhere. So this range will be measured R2 this power will be measured. Then the third large signal came from the ground. So this range again will be measured R3 and this power will be measured. So basically it takes in okay it will look okay where are like the instances where multiple power came in. Within that entire return signal it will sample only those points okay where it got like multiple power returns. So it may store 2 points, 3 points or 4 points based on the system. So for each laser pulse we will have multiple ranges measured along with its uh, power or intensity whatever we call. So for that particular ground point say this is like the point uh, the footprint of uh, laser beam x comma y you will, you will have 3 different points for that 1, 2, 3 this can be from the top of the tree this can be from the in between maybe like uh, small leaves or something is present this is from the ground. So we have 3 different elevation measurement for that particular footprint. So for that xy if you consider one xy as like one ground point you have 3 different measurements. Normally when you use this for a uh, large number of the uh, over like a two dimensional area we will have what is known as kind of like a point cloud maybe I will like tell it later ok. So this is like the discrete way of measurement of lidar signal. This was like the earliest uh, developments most of the systems worked in this discrete mode. But people realized for some of the applications especially for vegetation monitoring and all having uh, or storing the full return is beneficial for several modeling applications and so on. So some of the laser systems, LiDAR systems now stores the entire signal that is coming back like it is, uh, it either stores in analog form or even in digital form with like a very high sampling frequency. So it will try to store as much as high number of observations coming in within the beam. Say some systems may store uh, 50 or 60 returns sometimes which will be enough to cover like almost like all normal uh, layers 50 or 60 returns within each pulse that is possible. So a full waveform lidar may produce a more or less continuous representation of the signals that is coming back like the entire waveform that got reflected can be stored in the lidar system. So lidar system can be discrete or full waveform. So a discrete return system will produce a 3D point cloud information that is for each xy you will have many number of z points if you are talking in terms of like elevation measurement or here if I talk 
uh, in terms of like uh, say from a terrestrial perspective where you are measuring like horizontal distance say this is like a tree you have like large number of points that is being measured okay so each point is kind of like a scattering element which produced a back scatter towards a target so this is looking this picture b is from looking from like nadir perspective so here basically we are getting kind of like a point cloud if you look in three dimensions uh, say for each x y you will have uh, many number of z okay it will appear kind of like a point cloud say uh, you can classify all first return separately like first return means uh, whatever came in first from each pulse you can save it together first pulse return then you can store second return then you can store third return so if your system is capable of storing three returns per pulse you can store them separately as three different layers first return second return and third return and when you uh, see them simultaneously you will get uh, some kind of picture about the three dimensional nature of the terrain say all the first returns say if you are like uh, run, running the flight over like the forest all the first return might have come from like the canopy right so all the first return if you see them you will get a nature of like the canopy height maybe it may look something like this after like doing some sort of like interpolation then all the last returns if you put it can it can uh, it could have come from ground okay so it may look something like this this is like the last return this is not the point cloud this is uh, if you have like n number of points in one particular line you can join them using some interpolation mechanism so using that i am imagining as if it is joined together so this is like the interpolated first return point this is like the interpolated last return point so the difference in height at any given point the difference in first return and the last return may give you like the height of the structure that is standing over the point say if it is a tree if the first return came from the top of the tree and if the last return came from the ground then uh, last return minus first return is going to give you like the height of the tree imagine you can you are, if you are able to do this over like entire 2d space we are going to get a kind of like a three dimensional representation of the topography so this is like the major advantage of using like a lidar system instant very quickly you will be able to generate like a point cloud if you are able to like filter the point cloud properly apply some processing algorithms to it there are like highly specialized algorithms to it we are not going to see them in detail but uh, just i am telling you if you are able to process this we can separate these layers we can do some sort of like interpolation to it and get okay this is the topography of the terrain with all the features attached with it uh, let us say i need to have like a flood model or i need to model uh, how if at all there is a rain how the flood water will recede i want to generate a model for which surface topography is one of the very important information if that is the case then let us say i have like a um, uh, small like a urban settlement or something kind of it so these are like buildings here there are like trees and so on okay so if i have all the first returns and last returns then i can create like a elevation layer what you call like a digital elevation model which will tell me what is the elevation of my bare earth with respect to some datum or what is the elevation of my entire topography including the trees buildings and so on all these um, we will be all these information we will be able to get from by processing this point cloud so all the first returns might have come from the top surfaces buildings or tree tops all the last returns might have been from the uh, bare ground surfaces and so on we will be able to model these what is the elevation of the terrain uh, how the topography looks all these things i'll be able to model using this discrete return lidar system but as i told you for some research purposes especially like uh, for vegetation monitoring carbon up, uh, carbon cycle applications vegetation biomass application and all it is always uh, recommended to store like the full return of the waveform uh, that came back so full waveform lidar is preferred like whenever you want to measure like biomass of like a tree standing a tree may have especially forested trees uh, they may have like large number of leaves which will produce like multiple returns 
So if you store all of them, we will be able to position or we will be able to come to some sort of idea how many returns came in. So that many scattering elements were there present within the tree. It can be many number of leaves. So from this indirectly we can model the biomass. All these things is possible with full waveform LIDAR which is not possible from a discrete return LIDAR. So full waveform LIDAR also has received lot of attention nowadays and people are using it for several applications. And but one thing we have to remember is a full waveform LIDAR will store up lot of space in the computer memory. Like just imagine instead of like taking a 4 samples per pulse, now we are taking 60 to 70 samples per pulse which is like a tremendous increase right. So which will have like a large strain on the system. So normally like a full waveform LIDAR will use up lot of storage space. So as a summary in this lecture we discussed about like a, again like further basic principles of how LIDAR system works and also we discussed about like a full waveform LIDAR and a discrete return LIDAR. With this we end this lecture, thank you very much.